Das ist gut. Hello, everybody. I would like you to start by standing up, because now you've been sitting for 40 minutes and you probably need to move a bit. I want you to turn to your neighbor, and uh, I would like you to, to um, answer one question. Have you ever held back from sharing something at work? It could have been an idea you had, or a mistake you made, or a question you had, because you were worried about how people would react to it. Just turn to your neighbor and try to answer that question. Is this the one? Thank you. So if you answered no to this question, you're either incredibly confident or you're lying. <laughs> yeah, so psychological safety might be the most important thing in our organizations, where I'm going to mention it a bit later. But first, I would like to start with a statement. The agile force is strong in me. And by the way, I'm on the good side, so you don't need to worry. <laughs> and I say that because I'm actually agile in my personality. I have an agile personality. How do I know that? Because I know about my inner motives, my inner drives. And that makes me knowing that I'm agile from the heart. Many people are not, so it's not so difficult that we cannot convince managers in particular, in organizations, about how good Agile is. Today I'm going to talk about why the dinosaurs died, uh, why we can't go on like before, and what can HR and leaders do about that? Because it starts with HR and leaders, right? So first, to see if you recognize this man. Anybody? It's Charles Darwin. Yes, somebody knew it here. And he had this um, saying, he, he talked about survival of the fittest. Right? <laughs> and if you didn't understand exactly what he meant by that, you might think that he said that the strongest survive, but that was, of course, not what he said. What did he say? Yes, of course, the most agile, the most adaptable people there. They are the species, the animals and the plants that will survive uh, in a changing uh, environment, in a changing world. Um, you know the story about Ford and uh, Frederick Taylor, scientific management. And Ford, he had a quite easy job, right? He could pretty much standardize and he could pretty much 
work with cause and effect relationships. He knew that if I produce a thousand cars, I will sell a thousand cars. Very easy business uh, climate on that time. The world now has moved on, as you all know. Today, there are many, many car companies going after Tesla to, uh, to do the same thing that they, they have started to do. And of course, the T Ford, it only came in one model, one color. No competition whatsoever. So the world has uh, indeed changed. Uh, there was something about Henry Ford. He said that thinking is the hardest work there is, which is probably why so few engage in it. So he divided the workforce into thinkers and into doers. And it says something about the way he viewed people. And that's where it all starts. How do we view other people? Um, Douglas MacGregor uh, wrote The Human Side of Enterprise, and in that book he talks about what Bjarte brought up earlier today, Theory X and Theory Y. And we've already understood what that is, but do you believe in Theory X or Theory Y? Theory X being believing that people are really, by nature, lazy, unmotivated, they don't want to take responsibility, and you have to whip them with sticks or dangle carrots in front of them to be motivated? Or do you believe in theory why? That people want to be the best people they can be in this world, and they want to contribute to something larger than themselves. They want to do something that is meaningful. And they will do so if and if they get the right conditions. So do we have um, ex-people in the room? Who is the next person here? Who, do, who <laughs> believes they are ex? Nobody? No? Who believes they are Y? Yeah? <laughs> of course, it's a prejudice that we have about other people. They are ex-people. We are not ex-people. They are unmotivated, right? But actually, it's the structures in our organizations that makes people behave like X. They are not intrinsically X from the beginning. Everybody is a Y person. Everybody. So, this is important. Why is it important? Because how we view people affects how we structure our management processes. Like Bjarte talked about, if we believe that people are crooks, that people uh, want to game the system, yeah, then they might do that as well. And that's how we form our organizations, with the structures for the most terrible, lazy person that we can imagine. Fabiola Eiholzer talks about the Douglas effect. This is Douglas. This employee has a name. It's the worst possible employee. And we structure our management processes for that particular employee. Instead of, of uh, making them for 98% of the people in the company and taking these bad seeds aside, talking to them. I had to write a book about this because there was no book. So I wrote this book a couple of years ago. I'm also writing a new book. I hope it comes out ne next year. And there I will um, talk about my view of where will management and HR go from here? Because I believe that all HR persons and all managers will have to become agile people coaches. That's the future role for HR and management. And I'm forming a new training around that. That's my firm belief. That's the trends that we see. But what about agile HR? This is about the changed role of HR in the future of work. I have two images, the first one from Josh Bursin from 2011, a lot of years ago. Yeah, what has happened since then, we might think. Because he already then said that HR needs to focus on speed and customers and adaptability and innovation. They need to be more agile. But what happened since then? Not much. Why aren't HR changing? This is from the same author, Josh Bursin, HR analyst, from this year. Again, what is the change HR has to go through? 
and uh, from this waterfall model to a totally different way of working, designed to work with the customer. Together with the customer, we form our deliverables. Um, now, you might think I'm stupid because I say that HR needs to lead the agile transformation, but the transformation is all about people. And who are the people people in the organization? It's HR. That's why HR needs to lead the transformation. They hold on to these deep structures in the organization that makes it impossible po uh, to change if, uh, if we don't change those deep processes. It's change management, it's leadership programs, it's organizational development, performance management, competency development, recruitment, talent acquisition, all these deep processes. If HR doesn't change, then the organization is stuck as well. And uh, IT has started to understand this now, finally, after so many years. I started to give my course in 2011, and now I'm standing here almost, how, how many years later? Eight years later? And yeah, we are still in the same situations in most companies. But now I feel there is something moving, something is starting to happen. And agile coaches should, of course, report to HR, not to the, the CIO or, or uh, IT. Why? It's about the organizational perspective. It's about people. That's what the change is all about. We need to stop putting labels on people, closing them into job descriptions, closing them into roles, labeling them as high performers, low performers, average performers, and all these things that HR is doing so well in organizations today. They call it compliance, and they are policing managers. Uh, and, and employees in the organization. Instead, we need to work with T-shaped people and building a broad base and one or many specialist areas. So, in summary, Agile HR principles from developing policies, rules and standards to supporting flexibility and speed, collaboration, from delivering programs and processes to the customers, involving customer in the delivery. From HR specialists or HR generalists or HR administrators, we move towards T-shaped HR people who can take on many different roles, from individual work to teamwork, cross-functional, within the HR team. They work together. From functional HR specialist area to value stream-based HR, from jobs and positions to playing many different roles, from HR projects to stable high-performing teams, of course, from promotions and bonus programs to salary formulas, profit sharing, and merit money, where we use collective intelligence to decide about salaries. Delivering progress and processes is for the past. Instead, we support the organization to perform. One size does not fit all, no size fits all. Having the HR recipe to experimentation and human view X to human view Y. This is a very quick summary. Very nicely summarized in this beautiful um, sketch from one team that um, have tried to, to help this company Boomerang to change. This is the certification assignment in my training. Really love that one. What about leaders? How does that look like in the future of work? Well, it doesn't look like this, because we move from managing performance and control and command, micromanagement, to enabling performance, of course. The CEO is no longer the chief executive officer. The CEO is the chief enabling officer. And it's time for managers to get off that rocking horse where you have a checklist, a process, a system to do everything. You know, that's administrative leadership. Instead, we need to make people go in the direction that we want them to go because they want to go in that direction. That's le real leadership. That's inspirational leadership. Um, so it's a big change. But the greatest metaphor that I know for agile leadership is the gardener metaphor. So think about it. The company is a garden. 
and the garden has a purpose. It could be to be as beautiful as possible, or it could be to produce fruits or berries or vegetables or any other purpose. But the garden has a purpose. And who is the gardener? The manager is the gardener. The manager has to create the exact right conditions for all the different kinds of plants that are going to grow in the garden so that they together can fulfill the garden's purpose. Every plant is different from the, the other one. Some of them need a lot of sunshine, some of them need a lot of water or rain, some like to grow in the shadow, some need a lot of space around them, whereas some like to grow tight together, you know? Together is, a, is the word for them. But my point is that all leaders need to have this deep knowledge about their people. How do I make this specific plant grow? How can I create the conditions here in the soil for this kind of seed to grow, to become big and beautiful? And that's the knowledge that leaders need to, to have about that plant's basic needs. And if they still don't grow, what could, could go, uh, go wrong? I mean, you can scream to a plant to grow. You can scream, grow! The flower won't grow better because of that, right? So it's only about the conditions in the garden. If it doesn't grow, it could depend on two different things. One, the environment is wrong. Then we need to help the seed to wherever that seed can grow. It could be that wine, for example, doesn't grow in Sweden. It only grows in, in warmer countries. So we need to help the, the wine plant to go there. It could also be, actually, there are bad seeds. There are seeds that never will grow. So that's the second reason. What is culture? Because Agile is ultimately about a culture change. We talk about that all the time. And I love this uh, formula by Kurt Levin. It's from 1936. If we say, I believe, at least, that culture is the summary of all the behaviors, all the habits in an organization. Everything that people do and say, together we, we form the culture. So if, cul if uh, culture is then based on behaviors, how do we change culture? Well, we don't change it by trying to change people's personality. The P here is personality, the E is the environment. So we don't try to change people, we change the environment. In Agile we say, don't manage the people, manage the system. We try to change the system instead. All the processes, tools, methods that we have in the organization, or the infrastructure, the physical work environment. If we change the environment, we will make it possible for, for people to show new and different behaviors. And that, together with the deep knowledge about different people's needs, will make us a lot better leaders. So when it comes to performance management, HR asked me, what should we do instead? We have this classical performance management process. But instead of doing this giant performance management process uh, in one process, we need to divide the purpose of the uh, performance management because we have many purposes with performance management. It's not just to increase performance, it's also feedback and coaching. It's also about learning uh, and development, increasing performance, yes, and setting goals. And we need to make compensation decisions. So divide that pro process into the different purposes and use the appropriate tool for each part. It's not that difficult. Uh, psychological safety, we talked about it in the beginning. You asked each other a very good question. This is the platform for a system where it's possible to perform and be happy. And we, as leaders, we need to go first. Uh, we need to be vulnerable. So that's uh, the first rule. We need to ask a lot of questions. How can we solve this problem? We need everybody's brains here. Uh, I don't know how we should do. I don't have the answers. What do you think? How, how shall we go about it? So in a psychologically safe organization, we give feedback for work well done, and we let people fail. 
and we let them try again. And maybe they fail again, but in the end they will learn. So it's about continuous learning. The psychological danger happens when we are afraid to admit mistakes that we have done. We blame other people, and we are then also less likely to share different views. And then we fall victim for something that I call the common knowledge effect. And the common knowledge effect is when a lot of people know something, and then there is somebody who is saying, hey, I have a better idea, I have another view. Like Copernicus, you know? The guy who discovered that the Earth is round, not flat. He came to the scientists on his time and he said, hey, I have an idea, I, th I think actually that the Earth is round. And you know what they did to him? They threw him in jail and said that he was crazy. But he was actually right. So what we need to have instead are the psychological safe circles, where we are comfortable admitting mistakes, where we learn from failure, where everybody openly shares ideas, and then we get a much better decision and innovation climate in our companies. So continuous learning is the new normal. It's not a problem, it's actually the solution. Agile leadership principle goes the same way. Instead of building on control, we build on motivation. Instead of communicating via formal managers, we let communication flow free, because it does anyway. Instead of formal leadership, we can work with informal leadership as well. It's not a bad thing. Instead of micromanaging, we explain what, why and what, and we leave the how to the teams. Secret information to transparent information. Managers decide performance too. Everybody can decide performance for themselves and for other people in the team. Decision making by managers? No, everybody's involved. Goals are set by managers? No, everybody's involved here as well. From smart goals to objectives and key results, from formal managers to self-leadership, from managing people to managing the system, from human view X to human view Y. How to get started? Change journey. We don't have a recipe. Surprise. Best practice is past practice, and only mediocre companies use uh, best practice today. So there are no recipes for success. Follow the principles. That's what I've heard here today several speakers talk about. Follow the principles, increase them. You can occasionally use some tools and methods, but don't expect them to work in your organization if you don't have the right environment, the right earth. And now, having said that, I'm going to give you a recipe for change. Remove limiting structures, mainly from finance and HR. First step. It's actually a lot about removing stuff instead of adding more stuff. We remove limiting structures. Number two, increase supporting structures and, uh, to make it easy to behave in new ways, right? We change the environment, we change the system a bit, make it easy to behave in agile ways. And start showing new behaviors that come from learning new ways of working and acting. Repeat from one because these structures have a tendency to crawl back. Okay, last slide. I think I went a bit over here, but I was a bit late, I think, also. And you got to do that exercise at the beginning as well. So I hope I'm excused for taking a few minutes from your lunch. Enabling business agility, this is made by me and Bjarte Bogsnes, and Mia Kolmodin is the fantastic drawer who has done this. She's from Dandy People in Stockholm. So what we do is um, um, a one-day workshop. And you can register on agilepeople.se slash events if you would like to attend that workshop with me and Bjarte. Thank you very much for listening and for bearing with me all this time.